Welcome to the Wanderer Nepal special. Wanderer, the ultimate hippie trail journey is a great read and a hell of a lot of fun. Check it out. Follow the journey and our route on our website at wandererbook.com. Hi, I'm Steve Reifman, co-author of Wanderer. I recently celebrated the 50th anniversary of my ultimate hippie trail journey. My grand adventure, the inspiration for the book Wanderer, co-written with F.T. Burke. It took me across four continents through 26 countries in 1970 to 1971. On the golden anniversary of our adventure, we tell the true tales behind the story. It's week 40 of my year-long journey on the hippie trail from 50 years ago. Our intrepid hippie wanderer has arrived at the ultimate hippie haven destination on the globe, Kathmandu, Nepal. I'm terribly exhausted after the grueling journey on a rickety bus along the mountain roads after traveling across India. But soon I settle in for several weeks of enjoyment. A Swami tells my fortune. There are temples everywhere, even a monkey temple like behind me. The dope scene is incredible with offerings of anything one could imagine, cheap and legal. I write too and receive letters from family back home a half world away in Michigan, USA. In my second week in Nepal, July 1971, I settle in and continue to explore the area with a short bus trip to a neighboring mountain town, Dulikel. I read a letter I wrote to my family way back when. Hippies from around the world gather in Nepal because of the loose laws on hashish and prescription drugs, as well as the all-pervading, mind-expanding drug culture. In my third week in Nepal, I get my visa extended for five days, twice for a total of 25 days in the kingdom. I am reading Alan Watts and listening to Ravi Shankar as I find myself receptive to learning and absorbing the culture. I enjoy the plentiful drugs, though getting a little burnt out, as well as another acid trip in the mountains. Groovy times, dig it. I am pondering a wayward trip back to Western civilization overland. Our wanderer dreams of staying in Nepal forever, but the reality is that I will soon be leaving the Kathmandu Valley. These are my final days in Nepal. I can't get my visa extended anymore and I need to start heading home. My 25 days in Nepal go by so fast. Now the wanderer is back on the move. He leaves Nepal on a plane to the Indian town of Patna across the border. Come hear the exciting stories of this once-in-a-lifetime adventure. Join us on my Stevie Wander, our weekly wanderer adventure, which we kicked off in 2020. Wow, it's week 40. Look at that road. That's the way it was up, up, up the Himalayas to the Valley of Kathmandu. And it was an incredible journey. And it really took a lot out of me. I tried to avoid it by getting on a plane. Didn't work. So boom, boom. Anyway, we get to Kathmandu and my whole life changes. I finally get to this Mecca, this place I wanted to go for so long, this place that was a vision to me. July 3, 1971, Saturday. It's morning, the city of Kathmandu. A closed American Express, eating eggs, potatoes, and bacon, delicious. Then I'd run into Don the Canadian, who we lived with in McLeod Gunge at the Tibetan Memory. Wow. We head off towards the dairy, a famous spot amongst Western travelers in this part of the world for its cold milk and Western-style hard cheeses. While I'm there, a swami gets a hold of me with blue studded ringed eyes and he starts hustling me to convince me as to his validity and powers. Although a bit of a street hustler, he somehow captivates me, although I'm trying to escape and return to my friend Don and the dairy products. The Swami has a business card, which identifies him as Swami. He wears a turban, is light-skinned with a gray beard, yet clearly Indian. He carries a very thick paperback book entitled Numerology. His eyes are rung with blue makeup 
giving him a very exotic and esoteric look. The Swami starts telling me things about me and things I know about, he seems to know. July 5, 1971, Monday, Cat Mandu Nepal, much hashish, sold in small stores and by many other varied people on the streets, in cafes, etc. It is black and very strong. There's great Western style food everywhere and great rock and roll music to go along with it. Ready for the many Western hippie types to enjoy. I listened to Dylan, Highway 61 Revisited, The Rolling Stones, Get Your Yaya's Out, Let It Bleed, Woodstock 2, and much more that I'm really enjoying. I go to Swambu, a walk of a few miles in the valley. It's the Monkey Temple, way up on a hill outside town with monkeys all over the grounds. Great shows everywhere with them monkeying around. The stupa and the steps going up are quite an exercise on a hill, but still in the valley. And these freaks here are a real mind blower. Sometimes it's just too much for my head. And my mind starts to fry. Last night, there were six very nice looking ladies in the cabin, a place I like to hang out at, a cafe. I look and accept the flow because I feel incapable of the action necessary to try to woo these ladies. The life here is just fantastic. So is this place. Dick, Roger, and I now have a hookah in our room of our own. From a letter to my family, 10 July, 1971. What an experience. India is such an incredible land. It disgusts and delights me. Kathmandu is like some place of hippies dream. Hashish, marijuana, and opium are sold in stores with big signs in English. There are really good restaurants here that serve the best food I've had since Western Europe, plus many things better. The West is okay, but banana fritters, banana custard, mashed potatoes, and cheese omelets here are excellent. The food is so good after coming across Asia to get here. No one can figure out how they get all this food together. Get this. In these local restaurants, they have great music. Stones, Beatles, Dylan, etc. After having missed music the way I have, I just sit eating great food, listening to great music, smoking great dope right in the restaurant and really feeling at home. By the way, the cost of the meal is just 25 cents. There are so many hippie type travelers here. That's what's making it. All this set against ancient pagoda temples that are built everywhere in this ancient feeling land. The people are so simple. It's shocking. But there is such a beauty to this place. It's green and lush outside the city, five minutes away from where I stay. It rains softly here on occasion during each day, and it is technically the monsoon season. There are people living throughout the valley, and it's small towns to which I walk or ride a rented bicycle. There's a temple here they call Swambu, or the Monkey Temple, and it overlooks the valley on a hill. As I climbed up the steep, high, wide staircase leading to the temple up the side of the hill, here I am, all this set in the ancient pagoda temples that are built everywhere. It's wonderful. I really enjoy the atmosphere of Kathmandu and the hippie scene thousands of miles from the west. Good friends, good food, great buzz, wonderful music, far out people, native and travelers alike, and great living. Nepal has it all. Let's take a look at Kathmandu. This is the top of the monkey temple. Looking at it from a distance with the full moon behind it. Some of the neat buildings in Kathmandu. Temples all bound and all around. Seventeen July, nineteen seventy-one, Saturday, two a.m. on Speed and Stone. I refer to the journal 
that's because I've been stoned, like shit eating, grooving, going to Swambu, the monkey temple, and just living the life of a hippie and cat man do. It's been very homely and I've really enjoyed myself. The temple sits on top of a hill and that overlooks the city. And it's quite a view of Kathmandu and the rest of the valley. The valley has a ring of high mountains around it, although our view of the distance higher mountains has remained blocked by the cloud cover. I'm hoping for a clearing to see some of the big boys. Mount Everest is not too far away. If it weren't for the rainy season, I might walk up there. Why not? This place is so beautiful, no matter what season, I am sure. Sixteen July, 1971, Dick and I go up to a little town called Dulekil and we take a room for the night. We wake up at 5 a.m. to watch a cloud shrouded valley. The clouds hang like cotton in the valleys. There's no visible sunrise today, but just watching the cloud action in this incredible panorama is enough. We sit on an old outhouse, then on a bluff. And then they open up, the clouds open, and we can see the beautiful clouds as they approach and the mountain peaks peek out. And we laugh with astonishment at the incredible height of them. About 11 a.m., Don, the Canadian who we met where the Dalai Lama lives, turns up in Dulico with a nice little Chinese girl, American, of course, named Paula. And we go on blowing a few chillums and some joints to follow. We had a beautiful room in this country inn type place that had totally oriental beds placed on the floor with low lights and straw mats. We had a groovy time in the hot sun during the day and I got quite burnt, but not painfully. The mountains, I must see the real big boys someday. Perhaps a trip to the Tibetan border. The streets are dirt here, and they're dirty. What I mean by that is the little kids don't seem to wear diapers. They walk around with pants that have a split on the rear end between the buttocks so that when they want to go to the bathroom, they just bend down and crap on the streets. Oh, it's kind of disgusting. Pigs eat it. Well, I'm getting along, but it's a little rough here. I am loving Camp Mandu. The scene is very cool, besides a little stinky. All these crazy outlandish freedoms that Western types enjoy here are conversely nestled into the dichotomy of a culture of sweet, gentle Nepalese natives practicing their own brand of hybrid Buddhist Hinduism. It seems as if there is a multicolored temple reaching high in the sky for every Hindu god to be found somewhere around these environs of Kathmandu. Things have come to quite a lull for me here. Sometimes I really miss America and its convenient ways of life. But I suppose I really don't remember what I've left behind. I'm really excited to see the rat race again. This trip must have changed me an awful lot. It's so difficult here. Now, I look forward to watching the slow transition of east to west by traveling overland. Believe it or not, there are a relatively lot of tourists here. Europe must be packed with tourists. The children here are so incredible. They work at about seven years of age, and many smoke cigarettes regularly. It's pretty cute although depressing. Kathmandu is such a home-like place for me with its many young traveler hippie types. Great food and great music, yet it is the strangest place in the world. Incredible oriental temples, very religious observant people living their own breed of Buddhism and Hinduism everywhere. I've enjoyed Kathmandu so much. It's a good thing that visas are so difficult here. I had to get two five-day extensions to my 15-day visa, which extended my stay for 10 days. If not, 
I might never leave. We go back to Dooley Kill, our gang of guys and gals. After watching the clouds, Dick, Debbie, Sue, and I find this beautiful little temple set near water falling into a concrete pool. The English chick Debbie was nice. Sometimes I thought of trying to make love to her. I didn't, and it's been a while. By this time, in my third full week in Kathmandu, I'm a regular. I know the places to go. I understand where the good food is, where the music lies, where the dope shops are, and I'm getting to be in the groove. But the cool thing is these restaurants, the cabin. Oh, what a place it was. We go in there and order these omelets up, sit there, listen to the music. You could be there for hours, just enjoying the community, enjoying the music, enjoying the food, and having a great time, getting a little buzz on, and hanging out. This is a paradise that caters to all of us hippie freak and trepid travelers. The Kathmandu Valley in the Himalayas of Nepal is a magical place. Mount Everest isn't too far from here either, as the crow flies, but I have no plans to visit that big boy. My visa expires today. I'm here illegally. Tomorrow, I take a plane to Patnam, India, because I don't need a new Indian visa that way, I am told. Also, I can view those big boys, plus avoiding that hellacious ride on a bus trekking back and forth in the mountains for many, many hours, and the other rigors of the journey here. Twenty sixth July, nineteen seventy one, Monday, Kathmandu, Nepal. It's a quarter to six in the morning. My two English companions make it off to the trucks. They are on their way to Calcutta and points further east towards Australia. Dick and I spend last night together, getting very stoned and listening to music at the Eden Inn, our two most together interests. Well. It's another clean people's slate. Dick, Roger, and I had some great times together. Really, my whole Eastern epic upon entering Afghanistan. They left so early that the goodbye meant little. I probably could have cried. I love them, Dick especially. What a hilarious, lovable character. Well, all things must pass. I am alone now again in Kathmandu, Nepal. Twenty-seven July, nineteen seventy-one, Tuesday. I have a beautiful flight from Kathmandu. No big boys. The biggest mountains in the world are visible due to the clouds, but just to look down on the valley was enough. Jai Nepal, which means long live Nepal. Some trip there. This is Steve Reifman signing off. I hope you've enjoyed our travels. In the wonderful kingdom of Nepal, in the Kathmandu Valley and the Himalayan Mountains, I certainly did. And I hope you'll be looking forward to reading our wonderful book, *Wanderer: The Ultimate Hippie Trail Journey*. It's a great read, and it's going to make a wonderful series and some movies. And we're going to present this whole thing to the whole world in a visual sense. Take care, and it's been great to share this with you. Nepal was certainly something.